ready to start our today UK Russia legal discussions uh, order, organized by DIT Russia of the British Embassy in Moscow uh, in, with the support from uh, the British Chamber of Commerce. And I'm very happy to welcome our speakers uh, of the first webinar of the legal discussions that is dedicated today to dispute resolutions. And this is our first webinar in the whole series of legal webinars. And right now, I'm uh, very happy to give the floor to Alf Torrens, Executive Director of RBCC. Alf, you are welcome. Please. Thank you very much. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to today's webinar, during which our expert panelists will consider various aspects of dispute resolution. I've been given the honor of making the opening remarks. And, and as Anna just mentioned, my name's Alf Torrance. I'm the executive director of the Russia British Chamber of Commerce. And we've partnered DIT in this excellent series of legal discussions, which aims to explore some of the complex areas of the legal landscape as it pertains to Russian and UK business disputes. Firstly, I'd like to thank Trevor Lewis, director of DIT Russia, Lyudmila Stepanova, and Anna Rosanova of DIT, and the British Embassy for helping to organize these events. As a British Chamber, we recognize that a strong legal system underpins good business practice, and therefore we've always been very supportive of the cross fertilization of ideas in the legal sphere. Challenging political relationship, legal services is in an area where we can do more and more can be done between the two countries. And of course, we support this wholeheartedly. English law in London is well known as one of the most favoured options for settling international business disputes, although, of course, much is happening on the Russian arbitrage scene as well. And I know the interplay between the two systems will be discussed over the course of the day. The chamber itself has had a long relationship with MCAS here in Moscow. And as a bilateral chamber, we've also provided the Russian arbitrage services a platform on which they can explain how they operate. In any case, we have a great panel of, explore, of experts to explore uh, these matters today, several of whom are very good friends of the Chamber. Um, I'd like to uh, say hello to Artyom Dudko, partner at Osborne Clark, Svetlana London, partner at CIS London, Andrew Wordsworth, a partner at Radas, Alexei Abramov, partner at KPMG Law, and Paul Marmer, partner at Sherrod Solicitors. Thank you all for giving your time so generously, and we look forward to a really fascinating discussion this afternoon. On that note, I'm not sure, Anna, if Trevor is here, but if he is, I hand the floor over to Trevor. Alex, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction and introducing our today's uh, experts uh, within uh, UK legal uh, discussions. And uh, the first speaker for today is Artyom Dudko, partner at Osborne Clark. Um, Artyom, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the very kind invitation to be part of this event, which I'm sure understand as the first but hopefully first of many to come including at some point where we will be able to meet in person as in the good old days as they used to say so um, I have been asked to speak on a topic which I think is very important and, and I will try to be very practical about it the topic of my uh, short presentation is what to do in a situation where a business is anticipating that a dispute may arise or where a dispute has just arisen. Uh, as, it's, as I've been introduced, my name is Artur Madudko. I'm a partner and the head of the Russia CS disputes in London at Osborne Clark. So um, businesses are not involved in disputes in their day-to-day -day life, and it is probably best that disputes are avoided altogether. At least that's what I recommend to all of my clients. However, what is important is if a dispute does find itself in a dispute, if, if a business finds itself in a dispute situation, it is important to know what to do because those very first steps could be instrumental in how the situation ultimately unfolds and, and 
could assist in leading to a uh, efficient and cost-effective conclusion to the to the problem that has arisen. Um, being prepared should allow for a quicker exit from the dispute situation and allow the business to return to carry on with its usual activities of actually doing business rather than being involved and spending time and money on a dispute. To begin with, I'm going to look at the situation from two perspectives uh, and then I will give some uh, general tips and suggestions. The two perspectives uh, will be, first of all, a view of a business that believes that it has some sort of a problem or dispute with its counterparty. Let's call this part, this business, the potential claimant in a dispute. And then I will look at the situation from the view of a business that is faced with an unhappy counterparty who is claiming that uh, the second business has done something wrong. Let's call this second business the potential defendant. So we're going to look at the situation from these two different perspectives as to what to do uh, right at the beginning. And then there'll be some general tips and suggestions to follow after that. So uh, let's start from the viewpoint of the potential claimant. Uh, you as a business have been doing your day-to-day -day activities with a counterparty and you come to realize that you, they, your counterparty, are not doing what they are supposed to be. This could be, for example, that they have stopped paying for your goods or services, that they uh, have stopped performing their obligations, for example, supplying some sort of goods or service to you, or some other problem has arisen in the business relationship. And what should you do in that instance? Well, first of all, it is really important to involve members of your in-house legal team as soon as such a potential situation has arisen. This will be cost effective in the long run. If you don't have an in-house legal uh, team, then at the very least, you should have an informal conversation with an external disputes lawyer and get some initial uh, insights as to what you should and you should not be doing. Um, the second a uh, bit of advice would be that you should try to identify a specific individual within your organization who will take responsibility for coordinating the steps on trying to get the business out of this potential problem. And this is very important for subsequent coordination efforts that there is someone responsible for dealing with all of this. This individual potentially it could be a member of the legal team, if, if there is one, should start by identifying all relevant key individuals within your organization who have been involved in the relevant project in respect of which the problem has arisen. This will probably include the person who first identifies that there's a potential problem, others involved in uh, communicating with the relevant counterparty, and most probably someone from management or senior management who has overall responsibility for the relationship with the counterparty. It is then important to try to get an, as good an understanding of what the actual problem uh, is and the severity of, of this problem by speaking with the identified individuals and asking to provide copies of any key documents and materials. Assuming the problem is a serious one, it is then important to take stock of the situation and to agree next steps. In terms of taking stock, it is important to do a more thorough job of identifying any further individuals within the organization, or perhaps even outside of the organization, who are relevant and make sure that they are aware of the potential dispute and don't do something to worsen the situation. In terms of next steps, it is important to consider any obligations that your business may have to the counterparty and to see how you can avoid doing something that could potentially allow the counterparty to try to allocate some blame for the arisen problem or dispute on your side. It is also important to start thinking about the communications with the counterparty going forward to ensure that they are consistent and do not harm your position. Usually, it is best to streamline the communications and to limit them to a single channel of communication. At, a, at this stage, it is very important to set out in clear language the problem, the dispute situation that has arisen, and to present your side's position on, on this problem dispute to the counterparty in a formal letter. The purpose of this letter is to put the other side on notice that you are unhappy with something to specify what it is that you are unhappy with and why it is the counterparty's responsibility in your view.
and to explain clearly what you would like the counterparty to do to rectify the situation. This formal letter, it is important to get the language right, not to overstate matters, not to be unnecessarily emotional, but to be matter of fact, as precise as you can be, and that usually helps the situation. This formal letter starts the dialogue, which if handled properly should allow your side to resolve the dispute efficiently from the viewpoint of time and costs. Probably this is a good time to now consider the situation from the viewpoint of the potential defendant, as the formal letter from the counterparty expressing their unhappiness with something may be unexpected, or in some situations it actually may be anticipated, but in any event it will be an important sign that there is a serious problem, situation, potential conflict that should not be ignored. Potentially, individuals within your defendant organization or potential defendant organization may have heard some early expressions of unhappiness from individuals from your counterparty and would have some awareness of the problem. If you have good reporting systems within your organization, then the management in your organization would already be aware of the potential problem and this formal letter should not come as a surprise and you should be able to react to it quickly. But if it comes unexpectedly, then now is the time to uh, get organized and to make sure that you address it properly. Uh, as I've said, do not ignore this uh, formal notice of a potential dispute, as this will most likely end up being a more cost costly route to the ultimate resolution of the problem. Once you've received a formal notice uh, letter or have otherwise become aware of the potential dispute problem situation, you should focus on people, documents and communications. In terms of people, similarly to the potential claimant side, you should try to identify those within your organization uh, who would have relevant information on the potential problem and try to get to the bottom of your understanding of the situation and to your side's uh, position on the situation. Try to collect key documents and materials, including notes of any past conversations that you may have had with the, with the other side. And also, similarly to the claimant side, but attempt to streamline the communications going forward. So, being taking those very practical preliminary steps should then line you up into a better position to ultimately resolve the dispute. Now let's look at some specific tips and suggestions. First of all, documents. It is important to understand the word document in its widest possible sense. This includes everything from your standard documents such as contracts, uh, letter correspondence, etc. to everything including emails, photos, voicemails, and in today's world, WhatsApp messages, text messages, uh, other instant uh, forms of communications like Skype or Slack, any databases, uh, other electronic documents you, you may have. Drafts of final documents would also be potentially relevant documents. Uh, your working papers, any notes that you may have taken such as on a post-it note or any other handwritten notes irrespective of how formal or informal they are. These all potentially could be documents with relevant evidence for the potential dispute. So just be aware of this, that there is no uh, limited formal definition of what a document is. If there is a possibility of the dispute going to the English courts, you will have an obligation to preserve and stop the destruction of documents once you're aware of the dispute situation. A notice to this effect will probably be one of the first communications you receive from your own external English lawyers once you instruct them on your dispute. However, it's important that you're aware of this obligation and take it seriously in any event. Moving on from documents to communications. As just mentioned, be aware that informal communications, even through methods such as WhatsApp or similar, could be used as evidence. Best practice is not to allow the use of such informal communication methods at all by your business. However, as a minimum, it is important to avoid having two parallel lines of communications which are inconsistent. For example, messages in a formal letters from the organization saying some one thing, and then an informal WhatsApp from a senior manager to his friendly counterparty saying something else altogether. These inconsistencies will lead to problems further down the line. When communicating over the phone, 
please make sure to take a contemporaneous note of the call. Also, once you become aware of the dispute situation and you are aware of some recent calls or discussions for which no notes exist uh, yet, take a note as soon as possible while matters are still in your mind. The next specific uh, point to cover is privilege. Usually in litigation in the English courts, all documents that are relevant to a dispute situation, even if unhelpful, will have to be disclosed to the other side and ultimately will be seen by the judge. However, there are some limited exceptions to be aware of, and the key one, in my view, is privilege. Under English law, there are two types of privilege. Legal advice privilege, which extends to communications between a client and its lawyer, where the lawyer provides legal advice, and litigation privilege, which extends to communication between a lawyer and another party, such as a potential expert, about a client's dispute. Another exception uh, is without prejudice communications. These are also a very important tool to be aware about. And these are communications with the counterparty aimed at settling the dispute, where concessions can be made without such concessions appearing before the judge and influencing his or her decision. This is a very technical instrument, so you should involve lawyers in how best to utilize it, but be aware of this possibility. Something that is really important is once a dispute situation arises, you need to be focused on outcomes. You always have to keep in the front of your mind what it is that you want to achieve from the problem dispute situation and make sure that all efforts are focused on achieving the outcome. The potential outcomes could include one or more of recovery of sums due to you from the other side, ensuring that the other side performs the obligations that you believe that they have agreed to perform, closing the issue as quickly and cheaply as possible to be able to move on with the day-to-day -day business, demonstrating that the other side is wrong, or it could be some very other specific outcome, but be aware of it and make sure that all your efforts are focused on that. The route to a result. What you should be aware of that there are a number of different routes that a business can take to try to resolve a potential dispute or conflict, starting from the least informal negotiation which it is important to make sure is escalated to the right level at the right time. Then there is the possibility of mediation where you involve a neutral third party to try to help you reach a negotiated uh, agreement. And then obviously we turn to arbitration litigation, which are two uh, dispute resolution procedures that you need to make sure you are being advised by proper lawyers about how to get the best out of those uh, procedures. Tom, uh, make sure you talk to lawyers. Uh, Artem, and, I'm, I'm not sorry, I hate doing it, yeah. uh, interrupting you, uh, but I kind of ask you to be finishing so that we could give the floor to other speakers as well. Yep, yeah. one minute, I'm nearly finished. Thank you. Uh, so important talk to lawyers make sure you get some preliminary advice as early as possible and most lawyers will be able to give you some initial thoughts and comments without charging for their work so my three top tips once you know there is a dispute one limit discussions about the matter including through personal and informal forms of communication two involve lawyers as soon as possible even if informally and three take note of what was discussed and keep documents safe thank you that's it for me Thank you very much, Artyom, uh, for the clear guidance on what and how to how to do, how to cope with the uh, problems uh, in a situation where business is um, anticipating a, a dispute or is already in it. Uh, and um, before uh, giving the floor to Svetlana, I encourage our audience uh, to write your questions to our speakers during the webinar and we will be happy to uh, answer them in the Q&A session in the end of the webinar. And um, uh, Svetlana, you are welcome to start. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Um, Anna, I think if, uh, because I cannot see my presentation, uh, you might need to help me going from slides to slides. Um, if the, oh yes, slides are there. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, well, hello everyone. It's uh, absolutely great to see you all. And um, I think looking at uh, 
what Artyom said, and uh, I know him a lot over the years as a person who worked with multiple cases. I myself find, um, and in preparation to the seminar, I was thinking what can be the useful points uh, for somebody who is facing um, Russian related Russian aspect disputes in the UK. And I think one of the things I wanted to start with was mostly um, thinking about the dispute as a time capsule. Um, and one of the questions I prepared for Artyom for later on um, will be the limitation period. I think it will be very interesting for, Russia, for those Russian lawyers present at the webinar to know uh, for how long one needs to preserve all the information and all, everything. Uh, but going to uh, where I would like to start with uh, the time capsule of the disputes, I'm just taking one step back because uh, everything you would need to do, we already have got the guidance from Tom, and it absolutely coincides with um, how we would look at every situation, any, any dispute situation which is happening. But the disputes are quite a broad, uh, has a quite a broad meaning, and I want to uh, start from from the start in the in 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 the timeline and go to the point of quite often uh, the first thing you would need to do is to actually check what is in your contract because quite often uh, myself and the colleagues present here would be dealing with documents not necessarily very clear uh, about what governs the contract and what court or arbitration institution should be actually looking at it. And I think I want to put what Artyom said in, uh, in the perspective of different type of dispute resolution you might be facing. Uh, I think one point you would find yourself, um, and I, I understand that's why you all came to join the webinar, is that one way or another you would have chosen English law. And you would have looked at it um, as a law which allows you uh, to exercise fully uh, the freedom of contract and it's the certainty of the jurisdiction in a sense that when uh, the parties and London became a very uh, popular place for Russian disputes in a way because um, the English court um, and I'm specifically referring to here to the courts, can look at the provisions of, of the contract and the parties' relations, uh, relations and can interpret documents or even uh, verbal communications, which would otherwise, in our experience, would be um, completely non, um, not challengeable in a way uh, if you were to go to a court in Russia and say yes, simply because of the more formal approach. So the English court provides an ability, an English judge provides an ability to actually um, quite freely um, express the freedom of contract and rely on it to be enforceable. And I think where, you know, we, we, in theory you can, you can have a English law uh, provision um, and you might even use an SPV for that, uh, a special purpose vehicle to incorporate English law into your contract altogether. But um, in theory, Russian court now in experience shows will be asking multiple legal opinions from the English uh, solicitors, barristers and academics to interpret certain provisions of the contract. So naturally, what we see is that um, majority of people who choose, in English, choose the English law uh, and the parties will choose English courts or international arbitration. And I want you to put it in context of what Artyom was saying, because uh, very cleverly he actually covered both. And I think that's, that's very interesting that the approaches you just learned will be applicable to uh, both of the situations you, you might find yourself in. And uh, in terms of the um, difference, um, I would like to, uh, especially for those of you who are not lawyers um, and yourself putting yourself in negotiations with contracts. And I think this is where it becomes very important that uh, when you look at the English court, which will protect you in, ma in majority of situations, and we have a very clever concept called clean hands. You, you do have to come with clean hands to, to the English legal system. Um, I think one needs to remember it's not even about um, lawyers and documents and who prepared the transactions, but the people behind the business, the people who negotiated the deal and transaction and a, um, and a contract, the people who had the organization who might not be the lawyers, 
what they said and have done might also be relevant. And I think when you look at it from a point of your time capsule of the dispute, with all the practical things Artyom has said, I would say have a look at what you actually achieved in terms of whether you are in the English court, uh, which would be in your contract, or in an in international arbitration setting. The, I think the interesting part starts when, where you cannot find yourself in either of the places. And uh, from my experience, and I have worked with multiple films, um, uh, including the ones here on the panel uh, together, where um, sometimes you will be looking to get to the English law outside of your contract. Uh, that means, in any case, you will be dealing with so-called litigation in English court. And um, just to summarize why majority of parties will go for that is because English court will provide a wide discretion of how it looks at the contract. It has so-called equitable remedies and interim measures. And what that means is that when you look at the English law, which split between two, the common law, the law which is written and f quite fixed, and the equity, equitable law. And the uh, equity protects in the situations where you might not have a legal uh, provision before your conflict, before your court case, to actually cover your situation. But because the English judge is a source of law and he, provo he can create a legal, legal norm, the judge in a specific situation may, may actually create a law for your specific case. It does happen quite rarely, I think, nowadays, but it does happen if you go to a higher instances. On the opposite, and we do see that in a lot of Russian CS cases, what you would find is international arbitration clause. Uh, in which case, what you get in it, and I think this needs to be bear, uh, again borne in mind with those preparatory steps which we just learned is that international arbitration is a confidential process. So I would add to something our Tom said that be aware that once you get into arbitrations, you need to be very careful about confidentiality of the process. And you might not be able to use publicity and uh, people who are specializing on making certain disputes visible to the public in the situation of international arbitration. Also, international arbitration is finally bind binding. Uh, and what it means um, is that uh, after that, you, you have one go, and that one go is your arbitration. Um, when I say it, uh, be aware that, uh, that I think to my ex to my, from my experience, works in a very limited amount of jurisdictions. Luckily, England is one of them, where if you have had a proper, a proper constructed um, tribunal or arbit arbiter who is looking at your case, it is highly unlikely you will be able to challenge it on any type of grounds later on in English courts. And I think this is where the English courts provides a huge competition um, uh, in comparison with majority of jurisdictions where you had the arbitration, you've spent the, uh, the time and money because you do pay for arbitration out of your pocket, it's not paid by taxpayer. And then you have uh, your counterpart has another go in an internal court, which might drag for 10 years. Arbitrations here in the UK can be done very quickly and very efficiently, combining with the fact that they're confidential. And finally, recognition and enforcement. I'm sure majority of legal professionals joining the sessions will know that I think this gives a very big advantage. And uh, just getting from it, uh, I'm aware, I think um, I have another five minutes. I'm trying to be strict on time. Um, Anna, please flag me for one minute, uh, is common trends. Um, I kind of like to look at this specific area uh, from a point of uh, that as soon as you have a dispute, you have people and lawyers interested to do their best. And quite often we would see parallel proceedings. And in that sense, English uh, legal system, and I do include both litigations and arbitrations within that meaning, provides a good opportunity to actually go to the court, for instance, if you had in the contract arbitration clause, you were able to go to the court and actually refer the parties to arbitration, which is a great measure to have. Likewise, if, if you have um, something happening outside the litigation which has properly started in the UK, 
hopefully it wouldn't if you have taken all the steps you just learned before before with the previous speaker and so on but if you still able to go for injunction which is an equitable measure to actually try to stop parallel proceedings what we see and just to give you a flavor of uh, disputes we dealt with um, one of the disputes we had was um, a um, essentially an unfair prejudice case where the majority shareholders were prejudiced by minority shareholders out of English company. And that was a very interesting case because we started it with the point of can you actually bring the unfair prejudice for the benefit of majority? The answer is yes. Um, and what we had was that uh, the other side tried to initiate proceedings in multiple jurisdictions to impede the English proceedings. And in that case, they were, um, it was litigation. And we've done it with a team was very uh, very known solicitors firm and when we've got to um arbitrarily world uh, when we've got to the actual court decision ruling for our majority shareholders who were uh, essentially um prejudiced by by the minority shareholders with effective means of um what i would say were the fraud sections um, what we've seen is that even when we got to the uh, victory, which um, in this case, type of cases are um, actually very difficult to fight, um, apart from the multiple um, apart from the multiple attempts to initiate new, uh, proceedings everywhere else on technical grounds, including particularly in Russia, we had an attempt to set aside an arbitral awards, which we tried to recognize in Russia, because every, um, I think every good um, lawyer who practices in the UK will tell you that um, when you try to enforce something in Russia, and I believe we have a later on a speaker presenting on that on this more details, which will be very interesting, is um, you, you need to make sure that the Russia actually accepts it. And the other side in our case made every effort to stop recognition and we, we actually had to go to the highest uh, instance to prove it and overthrow the rejection of the recognition of the arbitral award. So I think um, uh, summarizing, I think I have one more minute to run, uh, summarizing English jurisdiction provides you a lot of measures including and don't forget sometimes you cannot stop proceedings in Russia but you can ask an English court for instance to provide you an order which will prohibit the participants, the other side, uh, for instance, of your proceedings, to actually not do things in Russia. And even though that would not stop the Russian court, it puts serious obligation on the other side not to do anything uh, with the fear of contempt of court, uh, which um, is, is essentially can be it's either civil or criminal offense. But it's a very strong measure. And um, I think sort of rounding my, my presentation up, I will be very happy to answer questions if you have on that one later on in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Svetlana, thank you very much uh, for your uh, highly uh, for your contribution, uh, which is highly appreciated. And um, right after Svetlana, we are <clears throat> we are ready to welcome Andrew Wordsworth. Uh, Indeed. Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I run an investigations company which specialises in disputes, and to a large extent, we specialise in disputes in the CIS and particularly in Russia and particularly going out of Russia, which I guess is our probably our absolute sweet spot. Now, there's um, two difficulties we talk about when you use investigators in international disputes. The first one being, which side are you working on? And are you working for someone who's come under attack in Russia and therefore has led to an international dispute? The Bering Vostok question. Are you working for a Russian who has arrived in London is being pursued by the state or by other people, which I guess um, the Sergei Pugachev question, with um, sitting there now as a liberal activist, of course. Um, and the third one, which I think I will choose to focus on, is the question of if you have someone who is your defendant who has left Russia and you're either suing them as a Westerner suing them outside Russia, or you're suing them as a Russian suing them outside Russia. Um, I think there's, yeah, it's, it's partly it's the most fun area always to cover because um, the other areas are maybe less amusing. 
Um, now, the next question is, do you need to have an investigator? What's the purpose of having an actual investigation? And there's a very easy pat answer, which one can go, oh, you always need an investigator. But actually, a lot of the time you don't. The person's got a load of money. He's sitting in London. You have all the evidence you need against them. You're confident you can simply move against them, sue them in London, and they will repay you. And at that moment, you know, do not waste your time on what are quite an expensive group investigators and do not spend money with us. Instead, just proceed with your action. Go to Artem. Um, go to Svetlana and work there. The question you, the three questions you have to ask as to whether you're actually going to need an investigator in such a case are these. First of all, you obviously think you have a case. Your lawyers have said to you, ah, oh, yes, you have a case. But do you have evidence of the case or will the evidence emerge from within the discovery or disclosure process once the legal action starts? If it will do and you're over the hurdle, you're not going to be dismissed at first interest, then again, there's no need for the investigator. When you need the investigator is where you think you understand the situation. Um, the question is badly documented. You believe that um, the contract you're relying on was written on a napkin in the Lanesborough Hotel in 2006 and everyone seems to have lost the napkin. Well, can you prove you were actually in the Lanesborough Hotel in 2006? Was your counterparty in the Lanesborough Hotel in 2006? Can you produce enough evidence to get you across the hurdle to um, say there is a case there? Can you then find other evidence, whether it be witnesses? Can you persuade people to talk? If you're fighting someone powerful, they may not want to talk. Can you or rather your investigators, could jolt them into saying, actually, we will be willing to be witnesses in this matter. I Can you find a way of getting them to agree to be witnesses in the matter without paying them large sums of money, which will undoubtedly be attacked by the other side when it eventually reaches the courtroom? At this moment, you need to have an investigator of some kind to help you. Um, next question. Will the other side be able to satisfy any judgment which you get? And this is a question which I think a lot of the legal profession for a long time believed was rather a vulgar question. It was delving into money which wasn't you know, necessarily something which the gentlemen at the bar thought they should be involved in. And the number of painful cases over my career where People have turned up and said, ah, yes, we have a judgment against X. We wish to enforce it. And there's no money there, not a fennig of any kind. And you say, well, did they defend the matter? Oh, no, they didn't bother to defend it any time. That was a clue, as we call it in investigations. Um, if someone isn't bothering to defend it, they probably don't think they will suffer a vast loss as a consequence of it. And having an act, a legal action against an empty sh shell is worthless. So if you don't know that they have assets which will satisfy your judgment, find out before starting the entire matter. If you're going to use litigation funding, which is incredibly popular now, where you can have someone go along and give your lawyer the money to actually to fight the action, they will all normally demand that you have done this investigation. A major part of our work in recent years has been producing reports saying, yes, we think X will be able to satisfy the judgment. They have hidden their money, but they have, n have not hidden it so well that it cannot be recovered. Um, if you could, you know, I think that's a, been useful in every way, because otherwise there is always a tendency to say, we've got a good case, we should pursue it. But pursuing it against someone who doesn't have any money is a waste of time in the extreme. Now, just to, as an aside of a litigation funding question, there has historically been some degree of unwillingness of a lot of the funders to fund CIS matters, partly because they are nervous about them, they're scared of the CIS, they think it's the wild, wild east and they're going to get into trouble. But I think, I don't know, Artem and Svetlana, I'm sure, could have a different 
beyond this. But I get the feeling they're getting more willing, they're getting more comfortable with the idea of doing it, providing they feel certain that they understand how the case is working and what the case is actually about. Um, you know, and of course, there are the Russian domestic funders like A1 Alpha Group's legal enforcement arm, which are both enforcing and fighting these matters continuously and funding them very merrily themselves. Okay, so find out if the person's got money, and that is, if you can't find it out yourself, then you need an investigator. If you can find it out yourself, you don't need an investigator, frankly. You can just uh, be satisfied with the level of knowledge you have. Okay. Third question, the jurisdiction question, and Svetlana quite rightly identifies the question of does the contract have a choice of law on the jurisdiction, but assuming it doesn't, and you want to get the incredible benefits of the, particularly the UK, but possibly the US legal system, how are you going to get jurisdiction in the UK? Um, does the person actually live in the UK? Do they come to the UK a lot? Do they have a real and substantial business in the UK? Can you actually establish this in a satisfactory fashion? And this has led to some of the great war stories of the investigative world, like um, the wonderful moment when Boris Berezovsky, the late lamented, was driving down Sloan Street and saw Roman Abramovich in the Hermes shop leapt out of his car carrying the legal bundle and hurled himself into Hermes to throw the bundle down at Roman's feet um, so as to get jurisdiction. Or the under wonderful moment where outside Mr. Deripaska's house on Chester Square for a number of years, a number of months, there was parked a moped which contained within it a video camera which allowed a remote operative to see when um, Mr. Deripaska arrived in his house, and again, to pursue him to the doorway and attempt to serve him. But ideally, you don't have to do this. Ideally, you're able to find the person lives in the place, has a sufficient attachment to the jurisdiction, so as you can actually serve them, and then you can move against them. But often you can't, and it's always a depressing moment when you have to say to a client, no, the person does not come to London. He doesn't go to London. He holidays somewhere else. He lives somewhere else. But if you don't know this again, you should think about whether you need to have an investigator to prove this thing. Because there's nothing worse than, again, spending all the money on preparing a UK case and then discovering that the individual has no intention of ever visiting London, has no attachment to London, has no teenage children at school in London. Work on understanding this and getting a, you know, getting the grasp of whether you can actually move against them in the UK. Otherwise, you're going to have to move against them somewhere else. And you shouldn't be resistant automatically against doing this. There are plenty of very successful legal actions taking place against individuals outside the UK. It's just the UK has this wonderfully broad judgment on its freezing orders, this disclosure orders, which allows you to theoretically get worldwide jurisdiction. So if you get a, an order in the UK, you get the benefit of that order in the BVI, all over the world, people will respond to the same order and that's incredibly worthwhile. So worth the battle on. Now the next um, question one's got to think of is, what will the investigator actually do for you? When should they be doing this? Now, I'd argue always that you should do a bunch of this investigation if you're trying to answer the questions at the beginning of the matter. Then you should slow down and say, well, now we've got to actually progress with the legal thing. We've got all the information we need to start this. It's only if we start to have problems um, that we potentially need to go back to the investigator and use them again. Um, what you don't want to be doing is getting a load of information which you will get otherwise as part of the litigation process. In one of the larger Russian matters we're involved in at the moment, we have um, a specific question which is, you know, who has the person been in communication with? Now, in that particular matter, we have the we've been able to get a insolvency order against the person. The insolvency order combined with Norwich Pharmacal order 
has forced the individual to disclose every bit of communication they've had. So any efforts which have been made by us at vast expense are completely moot because all of that information is emerging in any case from the individual's now seized telephone where they have failed to conceal their signal or WhatsApp messages. And this to some extent goes to Artem's point about um, disclosure and freezing the orders but the op and freezing the documents, but it also goes that if you believe you are going to be sued, you really must make a point of ensuring that you do not store all of your past communication on your telephone because it will be used against you if the information is disclosed and discovered. And in this world, we now know that that can happen very easily and the UK courts are very willing to be helpful to people about these disclosure points. Okay, so that's dealt possibly with the, the um, plaintiff side. Now to come on with to, to the defence side, which is largely a counter of how are you going to defend yourself against all of these things? How are you going to show that the other side does not have a case? Um, how are you going to demonstrate that you can't satisfy the judgment? How are you going to demonstrate that the UK is not an appropriate jurisdiction? And to some extent, this is a reversal. And there's always an interesting strand in the investigative words when people come to you and they say, I've hidden all of my money brilliantly. Can you demonstrate, that, can you look for it so as I'm satisfied that all of my assets are so well hidden that no one is going to recover them or move against them? And, you know, working on that side of the matter can be both entertaining and amusing because of course we can't automatically accept that the plaintiff moving against the individual is in the right. Quite possibly the individual has not stolen the assets and they are potentially entitled to be trying to conceal and hide the assets as they go through. Um, it's a it's a dilemma. But in any case, my core point, I think, which I'll probably finish on is this one. But do not use an investigator unless you're going to need them. Do not waste the money on them unless you're actually going to have a use for them. But when you do have a use for them, be ready to spend the money and actually use them for the purpose they're going to be good at. It's, um, it's a matter of a judgment call, which hopefully your lawyer will help you with. I think um, you have some clients who just want to spend the money and therefore you should avoid it. But generally, I'd say don't, uh, don't allow us or anyone else to waste your money. Use it when it's going to be worthwhile. I think. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much uh, for raising this investigative aspect uh, in uh, disputes. Uh, and uh, Alexei Abramov, are you ready uh, to be uh, the next to, to speak? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Anna for the chance to speak at this wonderful conference. And I know that it's the first time we switched to what's going on in Russia. They were talking about uh, how to prepare for a dispute, how the dispute goes on, um, about the recovery, about the uh, discovery of evidence. And uh, my topic is what's going on when it all comes to Russia. Um, in the first instance, uh, just, just a brief introduction. Here in Russia, we recognize three system of courts. It's a state courts, permanent tribunals existing in Russia and international courts. That's what was Svetlana talking about, international arbitration courts. They're getting more and more popular. They are famous, it's LCIA in the first place, one in Stockholm, another in uh, um, Singapore, but uh, many, many exist in Belarus, in Ukraine and in Europe, uh, which we also take into account. And all these courts, uh, they have great benefits because, again, confidentiality, as Svetlana said, it's um, high professionalism. Uh, they are devoid of uh, various political uh, trends. Uh, this uh, makes resolution of cases in these institutions comfortable. And one great benefit is that it can be enforced almost everywhere in the world, including Russia. Um, and uh, to give you a sense how long the process is, 
uh, I'll give you the stages of how it goes. First, Artyom told us about the preparations. Then it's again the resolutions Svetlana was talking about. Then a recognition of their work here in Russia. Then goes the enforcement itself and maybe even bankruptcy proceedings. So it's a very long, long way. I will be talking about, there's my presentation, by the way. I don't see it. Okay, excellent. I will be talking about stage two. It's enforcement, uh, it's recognition. It's the moment when uh, the decision of the court uh, is recognized and becomes valid in Russia for further legal actions. Um, again, the New York Convention that covers all this recognition and enforcement proceedings numbers uh, uh, certain causes when the dispute, the, the, the award will not be recognized. And in Russian law, they are basically replicated in arbitration legislation. Here, all of them on the screen. Uh, it's a lot of text, but basically uh, they all fall into three categories. Simple ones on the left of the screen. Those are breaching basically the laws of Russian Federation when uh, the Russian court is already reviewing the case when a limitation period for recognition. It's, it means that you come to the court with an arbitral award issued by CIA, LCIA has lapsed. And uh, most importantly, uh, the last one on the left is enforcement of the award uh, would contradict the public policy of the Russian Federation. That's the problematic one that is often used, we will talk about it later, often used uh, to... Uh, 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 to not to recognize the uh, the international war, conditional reasons on the right. These reasons must be pleaded. It means that the interested party has to prove that these things happened. Uh, most of them here are about the defects of the uh, arbitration agreement, and uh, the one in bold, again, the second one, which is very popular, a lack of notification, defects of notification of the proceedings. Well, it's understandable. The Russian court has to check how court somewhere abroad, maybe in Ukraine or in Belarus, resolve the case. Uh, and, uh, well, in terms of statistics, I, I forgot to notice, uh, note that we have around 50 cases like this a year in our courts, 50 cases where uh, international ar arbitral awards um, are recognized uh, in Russian courts. And uh, around 80 to 90% are positive, meaning that uh, the trend is fine uh, and uh, Russian, Russian courts tend to be very pro-arbitration. But there are surprises that can, uh, uh, that can happen when you, when you initiate such kind of action. Um, and it's the second slide, the public order. Here it is, the public policy. The court will reject to recognize the decision when it contradicts the public policy of Russia. And uh, is this the definition at the top of the screen, a set of fundamental principles, highest imperatives, universality, public significance, uh, economic, political, and legal system, this is, very, this is the legal definition of this, and this is, of course, very broad. And courts tend to uh, construe it very broadly. And this is one of the problems, because in this construction, they sometimes go very, very far. Uh, and uh, I would say that there are basically two trends here, two trends. It's the prof uh, first one, negative trend. Protectionalism. Whatever, uh, whatever is about uh, Russian governmental authorities, Russian uh, public officials has a, a very uh, low chance to being recognized because they, they, they treat it as a damage to the budget. Here I gave several examples of such cases. Of course, it's, uh, uh, each case has to be considered individually, but it's one of the trends. And second trend is the temptation of the courts to look deeper than necessary into substance of uh, the arbitral decisions. The, uh, the, it's again, like it's again, the pro maybe non-professionalism, I don't know why, why they do it, but 
uh, again, it's, each case is, uh, 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 is different. Well, the, the court can reassess the amount of penalties that was awarded. The, more, the court can uh, say something obsolete like, uh, like here, a word is inconsistent with the principle of legal certainty. They uh, challenge the choice of law sometimes, and they call all of these things uh, a breach of public policy, but it's not. Uh, there is another principle that uh, basically the, um, the arbitral award has the priority and they have to check only outrageous things that are in the decision. And this answering basically the question of Martin here at the question, question, uh, question screen are all the same. No, they are not all the same. The principles are the same. And I know that uh, there are difficulties with, uh, for obvious reasons, recognizing, for instance, Ukrainian decision or Belarusians, Belarusian uh, arbitral resolutions. Uh, but with LCIA and uh, S Stockholm and SIAC, um, there are less, less, less problems. Um, so all these things uh, have to be borne in mind when the dispute is resolved abroad. There my, there, the, 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 the decision, the, the, the text of the uh, award must be in general terms proper. Uh, and for the Russian court not to find anything uh, to allow itself to challenge it and somehow throw it apart. And uh, I need also to know the positive trend. Uh, they also use this public policy reason uh, to avoid the bad faith actions of the parties, which we also sometimes uh, meet. It's like uh, avoidance of taxes and uh, uh, fake arbitral decisions, such kind of things. Uh, so this is the, basically the first thing that must be taken into account when you litigate, when you even start litigating in London or somewhere uh, else, because the litigation itself is costly and you don't want to uh, lose yourself in the Russian courts trying to validate it here. As Svetlana said, for instance, that they had to go to the uh, highest authority uh, of the Russian, the Supreme Court of Russia to uh, resolve this particular thing. Another thing that Svetlana mentioned, it's also in my presentation, is notification. This can be uh, seen simple, but it's not again. Uh, I had a personal case when uh, the decision was not recognized because uh, the courier service that was used uh, was not uh, among the courier uh, services listed in the agreement, which can be used for notification. So it goes very narrow. And uh, uh, great attention must be paid to how it's done and what are the results of the notification, because again, it comes from somewhere where the court has never been. And it's always suspicion for the Rus suspicious for the Russian court. Uh, the practical recommendations to carefully draft and carefully read what is written in the agreement and basically use all means of notifications that is available to fix, uh, again, as Andrew said, maybe by WhatsApp, anyway, anyway, fix the fact that notification took place and uh, analyze where the uh, defendant is located uh, in fact. So there is a lot of work must be, technical work must be done around this. Last thing I want to mention is that my, and the, the name of the topic that I'm exploring here is a bit incorrect uh, because I'm talking about the recognition of their words, recognition of their words. And another thing is enforcement of their words. It's the moment when you're trying to seize money of your defendant. Andrew was talking that this has to be thought about when you initiate all the things, when you initiate all the procedure. And uh, uh, okay, you have uh, the rate of execution. You go to the bailiff. The bailiff has 5,000 of execution proceedings at the moment. It does nothing. It's very, very popular now that you end up in bankruptcy with all this. Uh, and uh, about bankruptcy law, like it's a huge, huge subject to talk about. I just need to say that it's undergoing now a very substantial 
uh, uh, transformation, very substantial reform. First stage was that our bankruptcy legislation was very ineffective. Why? Because the defendant stripped the company of all assets that it had and the, the creditors were left with nothing. The recovery rate was one to five percent maximum from all bankruptcy proceedings in the whole country. So they decided to do something around that. Next stage was that they introduced so-called subsidiary liability disputes and uh, uh, an option to challenge the transaction transactions by which the company was stripped of assets. I mean, when uh, the defendant acts in bad faith trying to hide everything, there was a way to overturn it and uh, try to get him personally by other legal proceedings and other cases. But this, and now we see it obviously, this strategy again uh, happened to be a bit ineffective because the number of this separate dispute has disputes has enormously increased and this basically clogged all the courts. And here I, I prepared for you, wanted to show you, this is a new law that is planned to be introduced in the near future. It's like, it's not a bankruptcy law, it's an amendment to the law uh, that uh, substantially changes the provisions on rehabilitation proceedings. Rehabilitation proceedings, meaning that uh, uh, not only you will be able to challenge what the defendant did, but uh, there are new ways how the defendant will get a life to get uh, to, to, to repay the debts. And uh, again, this will be a, a very big reform. It was planned that it will happen in this year, but it didn't. Hopefully next year, because all these rehabilitation proceedings are not functional at the moment. So this is basically, Anna, this is basically what, what I wanted to say. Thank you, everyone. Alexei, thank you very much uh, for uh, the recent, most recent updates uh, and even plans uh, on uh, the on what's happening in, in Russia uh, on recognition and enforcement of uh, arbitral um, awards in Russia, and um, I guess the the next uh, speaker is Paul Marmer. Uh, Paul, uh, are you ready to start your present uh, presentation? Thank you, Anna. So I'm Paul Marmer. I'm uh, head of litigation and dispute resolution at Sherrard's Solicitors in London. Uh, alongside my I, colleague. Um, take it, we oh. can't hear, uh, anyone can hear Anna. So um, wh why don't we um, move straight on to uh, Paul Marmer for, for the next uh, and final um, uh, speech. Paul? Oh, hello. I thought I was on air. Have I not come on air? Well, you need to unmute yourself. Am I back on air? Okay. Yes. So Anna's frozen, has she? Right, I'll start again. Now, I'm Paul Marmer, I'm Head of Litigation and Dispute Resolution at Sherrard's uh, Solicitors in London, alongside my colleague, Marta Grieve, uh, Ney Komiak, who uh, in turn has been working, both of us in Russian circles for a number of years. Marta set up a law firm in Astana, her last posting in Kazakhstan, uh, before coming over to the UK, uh, where she's been with us for five years. In fact, Marta and I were in Moscow uh, just when lockdown happened in March 2020, and the borders were closed, and we were trapped. I was really excited. Marta was less excited. Uh, I thought we'd be setting up our new office in Moscow City, but it was not going to be. We actually managed to get one of the last flights Seems out. Seems to have lost so, uh, two of the key people here. Always unfortunate. Have Have I gone again? Um, sorry, Andrew. You're You're. I, I'm still on air, am I? Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, um, I'll bring my presentation on if uh, you have my presentation, uh, Anna, uh, if that's working. Uh, okay, hopefully I can turn to the uh, first screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
and to the next page. Okay, okay. So if you can turn uh, the screen, that would be great. Anna, do you have a, uh, this isn't uh, perhaps going so well. Okay, so um, I'm back. Uh, for context, I thought I would start by setting out the structure of English court proceedings. We've heard uh, how you get ready for proceedings. Thank you, Anton. Uh, what happens when you get involved in, in, in English court proceedings? Uh, uh, the first stage of pleadings and an exchange of statements of case, uh, followed by a directions hearing, uh, which sets out the future conduct of the case and particularly in relation to disclosure and witness statements of fact, and then experts' uh, uh, opinions leading to a trial. And the judge has to uh, evaluate uh, which uh, and what evidence he is going to consider or she is going to consider. And if you could turn to the next screen. And actually, when all is said and done, uh, what we are dealing with is the key to winning a case in an English court is all down to the evidence. We've heard some talk about evidence already from some of our earlier speakers uh, uh, Anton and, and Svetlana. Um, effectively, admissible evidence is information or material, whether oral or documentary or electronically stored, that may be presented to the court to prove a fact and dispute and to enable the court to decide the issues or facts of a case. And that's by reference to witness statements, which are given ahead of any trial, and then during the course of the trial, the witness will be cross-examined on his or her evidence. And that is often and invariably in relation to uh, the disclosure and the documents. And cases are won and lost on the strength of the evidence and the disclosure that is provided. Uh, and when we're talking about these type of things, battles and cases, will often be won or lost when it comes to the reference to specifically bank statements, phone records, diaries, which is why somebody such as Andrew and his investigative agency can be so, so vital to access or failure of the case. I'm really focusing on disclosure, and Anna, if you could turn to the next screen. And ladies and gentlemen, when you think of Britain, what comes to mind? What's the quintessential uh, essence of England is, and, and Britain? Is it the Queen? Is it Beatles, the Oasis? Downton Abbey, if that's come over to Russia, cricket? No, ladies and gentlemen, it's disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. We are obsessed with disclosure in our court system. Now I know in the Russian system, you can provide disclosure if you want to try and secure uh, uh, and, and strengthen your case, but it's not essential. Whereas in the UK and in English proceedings in particular, it is uh, a prerequisite. And the purpose of disclosure is to make available evidence which either supports or undermines the respective parties' cases. And we have in the uh, British system a standard disclosure approach, which is cards on the table. You have to produce your evidence. And, and this is vital for, 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 for Russians to understand this. You also have to produce known adverse documents, documents which could harm your case. And we've already heard about one of the initial steps, which is document pres preservation, uh, where we will say to our clients, first and foremost, preserve your documents, prefer, pre, pre, preserve your communications, electronic communications in particular now. Most disclosure is actually emails, texts, WhatsApp messages. 
But you know what? The cases aren't won in what you produce. The cases are often lost in what a party fails to produce because somebody might, like me, will come along, will take on a case, and what we will do is unearth from the other side their failure to produce the relevant documents. We'll do that by making applications to obtain laptops, telephones, mobile devices, or use investigative agencies like Andrew and Radus. And there, when we're in the trial and the witness is in the box, they'll be cross-examined and they'll be presented with evidence that shows that they have not produced all the material that they should have done. Um, remember, in a sex scandal, it's never the actual sex instance itself that brings people down. It's the cover-up. It's always the cover-up. That is why, as I say, we are obsessed in England with disclosure absolutely obsessed uh, and if you could turn to the next stage uh, the next slide um, now uh, because electronic disclosure is effectively taking over when I began practice it was all paper-based uh, and now through my career I've seen the proliferation of disclosure uh, 20-fold because of the electronic disclosure that uh, uh, the, the reality of life and the English British court system is trying to address that with a pilot scheme uh, which is now going to be issue-based disclosure, which is actually leading to even more disputes because every issue is going to be the subject of a battle. Uh, and we're currently involved in a case involving the pilot scheme, which is uh, incredibly complicated, but it takes each issue in a case, digests them down uh, to, to, to what are the classes of documents. And I do know from our experience working with Russian banks, for instance, that our disclosure causes banks a great deal of problem or any financial institution because of uh, Russian secrecy laws. And there is a tension there between the obligations of disclosure for an English court proceeding and uh, Russian secrecy laws, which have to be navigated around. Um, I'm conscious of time. Uh, if you could just take us to the next slide. Uh, we. Uh, have recently been involved in a case, uh, Tatneft and Bogolov and others, in a successful defense of a $300 million claim. And uh, this was a claim brought in the UK by Tatneft, the oil company, against our client, fourth defendant, uh, pursuant to Article 1064 of the Russian Civil Code. Uh, the UK court accepted that the, tie, the claim was time barred under the Russian Civil Code and Sefalana mentioned time bar. And other than being obsessed with disclosure, I think, yeah, time bar and limitation is really important and critical to match up how things work in Russia with the English uh, legal system. Uh, the case was the largest commercial high court virtual trial in UK history, which gave rise to uh, its own problems um, we had 25 witnesses of fact giving evidence from five jurisdictions. Uh, what actually uh, has been reported though, and if you could turn to the final slide, uh, please, is that uh, it set out a precedent for legal advice privilege um, concerning Russian companies, which we heard about legal advice privilege before, whereby uh, communications between lawyers and clients will be governed by privilege and so won't be subject to disclosure ordinarily. In this case, uh, where there were lawyers empl em employed by a company and a Russian company, in this case it was it was Tatnev who had an in-house uh, legal uh, team, an application was brought to try and challenge whether privilege would apply and the second defendant actually made an application to try and persuade the English court that only a Russian advocate who's called to the Russian bar could attract advocate secrecy. And the English judge found that in practice, there was no difference whether secrecy or privilege is concerned. With an in-house lawyer who is employed by a business or a bank, or company, as opposed to a Russian advocate. So whether the uh, uh, in-house lawyer is actually regulated, registered with the bar, 
uh, or indeed qualified, still if they're carrying out a uh, process of uh, working in a legal department, it will be covered for privilege. I don't know if you have the expression in Russia, if it looks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, and it looks like a duck and it flies like a duck, it's a duck, and that's how privilege will work. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's my presentation for this afternoon. I said to you that our last trip to Moscow was just before lockdown, and I'm pleased to say that Marta has managed to get, make it out to Moscow and is actually in Moscow right at this point in time. Uh, should anybody want to meet her, she's there for another week and hopefully she'll manage to get out again this time. So, Anna, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for sharing your expertise and real case uh, presentation. Uh, thanks to all of our speakers. And in the chat, there are a couple of questions. Maybe you can see them. Um, let me see the first. There was a question from uh, Martin, would you say that enforcement in Russia of an arbitral award obtained in, say, London is more difficult uh, than an award obtained in, for example, Stockholm, or is it all the same? Uh, who would like to take the, the question? And I think that we already, we answered. already answered. Okay. Artem, no, I don't want to comment on that. Okay. Please, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, then there are uh, there was a question uh, on the presentations. Um, will that be possible to get presentations? Um, are, are whether our speakers are ready to share them? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, great. Well, anyway, the recording of the session uh, after some time will be available and uh, will be sent out to those present and registered. Uh, we will be happy to share. Um, and I uh, and Svetlana, yeah, you had a you had questions, right? For the speakers, yes, and speakers. observations for everyone. I think the first one is, and the limitation period has been mentioned by Paul and Artyom, and I think this is, um, I, would, I think the English has, have the saying, the lame, lame dunk, this is a very interesting area. But I think it would be great maybe if Artyom actually says how long it is in English uh, courts, uh, we should be watchful for limitation period. And the reason is it will define what sort of documents and correspondence you would uh, need to preserve. Anton, uh, Artyom, I wondered if you could, um, I think for the benefit of Russian lawyers and otherwise, um, give an idea of the timeline so they aware of that. Sure, Svetlana, thanks for the, for the question. Uh, I mean, there's, as always, there are nuances involved, but the, the basic position that I think should be taken as the starting point is that for according to statute for contractual disputes and tortious claims, the standard limitation period is six years. If it is a contract that has been entered as a deed, then the six years extends to 12 years. And then the third final high level comment is that in your contract, you can actually specify a shorter limitation period if you want to. And in a lot of corporate transactions, for example, limitations are reduced to one or two years. So that's three very high level points. There's a lot of nuance and detail. Starting point six years could be as long as 12, but you can make it shorter if you agree with the other side. Brilliant, Artem. Thank you. I think that's that's very interesting, and this is one of the things is that you were both quite low when I learned it. I said, well, at least it starts with a double from what a Russian lawyer would usually be looking at. And I think if I made the two observations which I had was just to unify 
um, I thought was absolutely coherent presentation from start to finish is one is, and I know Marta very well as well, hopefully I'm going to see her in Moscow next week where I'm too, uh, but coming to what Paul said, uh, I want to uh, maybe um, to take it from my perspective as a person who spoke about legal privilege and in-house councils for a long time. What Paul said is a revolution because before that case, uh, the problem with, uh, and I'm, I'm setting aside sort of the advocate slash consultant argument, but the problem was with whether the internal counsels of the companies and what they gave as an advice uh, privileged information. And I think uh, I would definitely be looking into the case because um, it's, um, it's, it feels absolutely great that your film has won on this uh, point. And more than that, as an observation, again, I, I say it as a dual qualified lawyer running a, a law firm in London, is that um, it feels sometimes that there is a it, Russian law within English system which evolves and rotates. And when you approach an English, Russian uh, cases in England, please be watchful of it because there are interpretations of the Russian legal provision there. And Paul gave us a taste of a brilliant work on making sure that, you know, not just the uh, external lawyers consultants are protected, but the internal communications with lawyers are protected as well. I think that's one uh, observation. The second one, if I may, was to Alexei, a uh, brilliant one. And I'm very glad I didn't go deep into the notifications. But what Alexia gave us a slide, please um, give the please get his presentation because I'm definitely getting one. Is we had the case where you know, we we I think this is where you you try to follow the rules, and at the end of the day you can find yourself that the, the other side challenges you on a highly technical point. So my recommendation will be definitely. Uh, you talk to the lawyers like Alex said to ensure that while you're speaking to your English lawyers and solicitors and barristers and following all English rules, it doesn't actually guarantee you success unless you have, uh, and it makes sense in the cross-border cases, unless you have a cross-border team, you're not going to kick, kick off the bosses. The one positive trend, and I'm sure Alexei knows that we definitely do this a lot, is that um, on every contract, say, which cut passes through us, we check the man whether it complies with mandatory provisions of Russian law. And I think it's like a red herring. If it doesn't, and you at that special point where you're not in the court yet and you haven't experienced English legal system and you're still drafting that contract or you are instructing somebody to draft that contract, make sure that you pick up those points and make sure that the team which runs this project for you is truly multi-jurisdictional because one way or another, those cases always build on the strengths of multi-jurisdictional teams. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Could I just jump in and echo what Sabana says? It's absolutely essential to have a Russian-based team with an English-based team. That is absolutely true. Look, for full disclosure myself, I should say that um, I was able to talk about the Tatnev case. We won the whole case, but we actually lost that battle because it was my side who was trying to challenge legal professional privilege for in-house counsel. So I have to confess, we lost that particular application, but because we won the case, I'm prepared to talk about it. But it has, as you say, set out a huge precedent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it, it, all, all, all concerning Russian companies. But actually, it's affecting from an English court perspective companies all over the world. But, uh, Thank you, Paul. Great contribution. Thank you all. It was, um, well, I, I should say, it, for, for me personally, it was a great pleasure to be in such a great company of uh, unique professionals. Uh, and probably, Alf, uh, uh, would you like to say uh, some closing remarks to uh, end our session? You are on mute. Thank you, Anna, again, for organizing such a, a fascinating discussion. Um, uh, as you said, this is the first in a, a series of uh, hopefully um, several, uh, and, and the theme will continue, and, and we'll be able to explore some of these uh, very uh, interesting matters in, in more depth as we go along. 
Um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. I, I know you've all got busy schedules and it's great that we had such a good turnout. I, I noticed about 100 people, so that's great. Uh, we're, we're having uh, the effect and, and reaching the people um, we, we want to be reaching. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. And on that note, um, Anna, when's the next one? Uh, have you published a date yet? Uh, it TBC, to be common confirmed, but we hope that it will be in the end of October. Great. Okay, so um, just keep keep um, looking out at, uh, at our website. Uh, we'll, we'll pass the information on. Obviously, DIT will communicate with you as well, and we very much look forward to seeing you at the next event. So for now, thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.